there are seven heavenly bodies, seven things in the sky that move with respect to the stars. So that's the uh, Sun and the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. These are the seven heavenly bodies that are observable with, with, the, uh, with the naked eye. So if I believe that this number, the fact that there are precisely seven of these heavenly objects, is indeed highly significant uh, for the has always been a fundamental aspect of human culture. We can see that in the uh, great number of sevens that pop up everywhere else in, in uh, numerous places. For example, seven days of uh, creation, which is also the reason why we have seven days of a week. You know? So, uh, you here are some illustrations then of the seven days of creation according to to the Bible. So, you know, just one day for creating the earth and so on. You know? So the animals and the humans here, and then the day of rest uh, is the last one, and so on. Well, uh, that's uh, so that's one uh, occurrence of the number seven. Another one is uh, seven notes of the octave in music. It's very fundamental to number seven because you have do 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 do, -do and seven, you know by the time you hit number eight, you have already uh, repeated the full octave, and you're back again to the same note that you that you started with. So there are precisely seven notes in the octave. Uh, in the Pythagorean tradition, certainly chosen with the heavenly seven in mind, uh, in my estimation. So, you know, one imagines that the heavenly bodies uh, perform a kind of uh, a music of the spheres, as it was called. And so, there is a great uh, the idea that uh, music that we create is a kind of uh, mimicking the harmony of the universe that performing in the heavens uh, so certainly this the fact that there are sevens in both of these places is not an accident at all and uh, we have also the seven colors of the rainbow uh, which is a year today everybody is taught that there are seven colors of the rainbow and Newton was the one who standardized this idea that there are seven colors of the rainbow however it's not really an objective scientific fact uh, you know you, you can see for yourself how you how are you going to separate exactly seven from this uh, rainbow there? But it's not uh, such a trivial matter. In fact, uh, Newton himself, in his early lectures on optics, actually used five colors of the rainbow. And uh, only later changed it to seven on purpose for the sake of the analogy with music. So he is thinking certain uh, color combinations go better than others. You know, just as certain notes, you have chords and things that sound very pleasant when you're two notes are played together and uh, in the same way you can have one color matches really beautifully whereas uh, certain other color combinations are, are uh, kind of a discord, you know, they clash with each other just as musical notes will do if you play the wrong combinations. So, you know, that's but that was Newton's uh, reason for putting seven colors in the rainbow. So all of these sevens, they keep reoccurring in this manner and, you know, uh, uh, the number five I mentioned was Newton's original pick for the number of uh, colors of the rainbow and also the number five is fundamental in uh, another respect, namely there are precisely five regular polyhedra which I have shown over here these bodies made up of regular polygons so there are precisely five of those as proved in uh, Euclid's elements and uh, that is uh, indeed a very fundamental uh, sort of uh, the, the if you might say the heavens have chosen the number sevens, you know the, the number seven is kind of written in the skies because there are seven heavenly, heavenly bodies, but there are five regular polyhedra, so so geometry has chosen the number five, as it were, it's the the constant of geometry, and so the, you know you might think that uh, well there aren't there all kinds of geometrical objects that have so and so many of them, not really. This five is really very exceptional. This is a very exceptional state of affairs that you have five. Uh, exceptional objects in this in this fashion so that made a profound impression on uh, early early man in, in, in Greek culture for example the five regular polyhedra became associated with the elements so traditionally there are four elements obviously earth water wind and fire um, which become associated with the elements in the manner shown in this drawing it was a, they become associated with the regular polyhedra in the manner uh, indicated in these drawings, which are drawn by Kepler, actually, uh, later, uh, you know, 17th century uh, astronomer. So, we see here that, for example, the cube, uh, the, by the bottom left here, that is 
earth is associated with the element earth as the illustration shows and you can understand that uh, you know a cube is very kind of bulky type of thing something that stacks well and so on. so that associates with earth that makes a lot of sense and then we have these uh, these other elements and naturally the tetrahedron is fire over here that's the because it's the pointiest of all the polyhedra it's it's very uh, so quick and, and sharp, you know, like fire can break through things. It's it's very elusive, so so that's why it makes sense that the, the uh, that guy and air is the one that's kind of similar to fire because it's very light, also very elusive. Whereas water then is this heavy, heavier uh, associated with the heavier uh, polyhedra naturally. And uh, uh, for the the fifth element, you have the Dodecahedron remains, uh, which is associated with the uh, with the heavens, the universe, and indeed you can understand this because you need one more element for the heavens. This is also to Plato's and, and Aristotle's theory uh, with harmonizes with with this need for a fifth element, which is supplied by mathematics. Then, because in on Earth you have Earth and water are heavy elements; they want to go down. They travel in straight lines. If you just let them go, they're going to go straight down. It's just center of the earth. Whereas air and fire are light elements, they want to go up. They also go travel in straight lines, they are trying to escape upwards all the time. So therefore, uh, heavenly bodies which go round and round in circle, circular motion is their natural motion. So they cannot be made of any of the earthly elements, because they, they only have rectilinear motion as their natural motion. So you see how the fifth element, the fifth regular polyhedra, supplies precisely what the cosmography needs here namely a fifth element whose natural motion is circular as opposed to the four uh, terrestrial elements. So that's a fantastic uh, little uh, remarkable application of geometry then to the constituent parts of the universe. And uh, remarkably, both of these magic numbers, the number seven of the heavens and the number five of geometry, are both written into man. Because we have seven windows of the head, that's you, you count it off on this bust of Pythagoras that I have shown here. So you have eye, eye, ear, ear, nose, nose, mouth, that's seven, seven windows of the head. And there's also a lot of the five fingers, everybody knows their five fingers. So that's, um, you know, the creator has made man the uh, uh, kind of crown of his creation, as it were, a real. Uh, written the fundamental mathematical numbers into into his, uh, his image here so uh, you know uh, this this type of perspective was certainly very prominent in ancient Greek times this is the way one word uh, the way to view numbers at that time and you might think now at this point we have reached a rather fantastic uh, kind of harmony between these two numbers they each have their use and they all uh, kind of place into cosmographical views and in a, in a harmonious way, and they both come together in in uh, the uh, the human body in this fashion shown here. So that's pretty uh, satisfying. However, it uh, actually the story continues. That so that was kind of the Greek uh, uh, the pinnacle of you know the synthesis as far as the Greeks are concerned. But here. Uh, I would like to continue the story in, as it played out in the 17th century and for this purpose we need to compare so this is the old way of looking at the universe we have the earth in the center there and then we have the seven heavenly bodies just layered outside of it so that's the uh, traditional conception of the solar system which was used in Greek days so the earth centered solar system but then of course Copernicus in the Copernican system in, in the modern era uh, in scientific revolution, we replaced the Earth-centered conception of the solar system with the Sun-centered one. Here you can see the Sun is in the middle, obviously, and then you have the seven, uh, the, the the other heavenly bodies layered outside of it. However, uh, there's a change now in in terms of numbers because it used to be that there were seven layers outside of the Earth, but now there are only six layers outside of the Sun because the moon is attached to the earth. It used to be that the moon was a separate entity uh, comparable to, to the planets. You know, it's just like another planet like the other guy. But now you have a different situation where the moon is attached to the 
course, as you can see here, uh, above the sun here in this drawing. So there are now actually only six planets uh, instead of the seven heavenly bodies. There are now six planets when you look at it from this point of view. Now, this is what Kepler uh, wanted to understand. Why would there be six planets? And he realized that this can be explained, as it were, by means of the fact that there are five regular polyhedra. So he was certainly very much a, you know, enthusiastic about his Greek tradition of thinking numerologically about these things. So that's why he made this uh, model of the solar system in this fashion. Because there are six planets, six layers, six orbits outside of the Sun, that means there are five gaps between them, which means that but there are five regular polyhedra, so that explains why there are six layers, because there's one polyhedra precisely to go in between, and that explains exactly the spacing between the different planets, so why is one planet's uh, orbit so much bigger than the next, and so on. But the, well, the, it, surely the creator of the universe didn't just scatter the planets around uh, randomly. No, according to Kepler, the creator of the universe must have selected carefully the number of planets, he made them precisely six, because of the regular polyhedra, there are five regular polyhedra to him, he chose them to match, and he spaced the planets, the distances between the planets, in a manner corresponding precisely to the sizes of the regular polyhedra in the fashion shown here. That you make a sphere, and then you put the largest polyhedra that, that fits inside the sphere, and then the largest sphere fitting inside of that, and so on, in this nested fashion that every everybody is touching, touching the one outside of it, and you just when you stack things together in this fashion, that determines then the sizes of the various planetary orbits. All of these uh, rings here are going to be the orbits of various uh, of, the, of the seven planets. So, you know, in this fashion, you explain why there are so many planets and why the distances between the planets are what they are, which is uh, a uh, uh, you know pretty remarkable that this theory actually works reasonably well. Of course, today we would say, well, there's no, you know, the planets are just kind of scattered, really, it's pretty much random, but uh, actually the theory works out remarkably well and uh, it fits more or less, you know, the, the facts. So, certainly you can understand Kepler's enthusiasm about this. Kepler was not the only one who was very enthusiastic about it. There's a great, uh, uh, very popular, a, a, theory at the time. So, because everybody was uh, still had this a ancient Greek num numerological manner of thinking in the back of their heads and they wanted to look for these kinds of uh, divine design on, on the universe kind of thing. So, that was uh, uh, all a fantastic uh, discovery there that Kepler was so proud of, but you all know that Kepler later uh, discovered that the uh, planetary orbits are actually not circular, rather like the previous picture uh, more or less had circles. But of course, Kepler famously discovered that the planetary orbits are rather elliptical, not circular, like he is shown here in this from from his great work Astronomia Nova. So the uh, the planets are ellipses, and that kind of ruins the previous image a little bit because you don't have, you know, the, you wanted to have a sphere. Uh, the, the whole theory was built on the idea that there were spheres fitting around the polyhedra, layer by layer, one sphere, one polyhedra, one sphere, one polyhedra. So that goes with the idea of circular planetary orbits, but if circles, if they're not circles, but rather ellipses, you kind of squash it, as well, it, it kind of breaks the, the mold there and ruins the theory. So, uh, was this then the final uh, death blow for all numerology? Maybe, uh, you know, Kepler's initial theory, theory of his youth, the one with the polyhedra, that's this one, uh, obviously has nothing to do with modern science, and then later, in his more mature scientific work, he discovered the law of ellipses, which is now still accepted today, that planets do move in ellipses, and, you know, Kepler is hailed for having discovered this important fact, law of, of astronomy. So we might say, uh, we progressed from this numerological, uh, Mambu Jambu type of thinking, which was this stuff, and we went into proper science, and then there was no longer any room for thinking about this numerology and nonsense. Well, if that's what you think, you would be wrong. In fact, Kepler did not at all give up on numerology because he made his discovery of the ellipses. No, he simply 
went back to the drawing board as it were it used to be that you know when we were looking at this point of view we were saying there are six planets I have to explain why there are six planets well that's because there are five regular polyhedra that's why there are six planets that's why the planets are arranged in this fashion now if I have ellipses instead then there are no longer uh, the number six is not the number to be explained because now rather it's the number 12 because each orbit now has two numbers associated with it the greatest and the least radius you know an ellipse is like a squashed circle basically so it has like a major diameter the longest one and then a minor diameter the little one so instead of having just one size of the orbit which was the important factor in the in the old model you now have two uh, sizes of the orbit so to speak the maximum and the minimum uh, radius which gives a total of 12 then there are six planets and two of these um, you know a maximum and a minimum each makes a total of 12 but think 12 that is actually also a numerological very important number because in a musical context you remember there are seven notes in the octave if you hit the key number eight here you're back it's the same the same uh, note as, as the first one you know it's another C from from the first C or something like that. so that uh, that's the uh, so the number seven is the number of uh, notes in a simple octave however on a modern piano you also have these black keys which are designed for uh, modulating from one key to the other you know if you're gonna play everything in C you wouldn't need any black keys but if you're gonna change and you play oh no this Sonata is written in in A, you see. Well, then you have to use some some black keys and so. So so therefore, uh, you need in fact you need exactly five black keys per octave. So that is gives you a total of twelve. Well, twelve. So there are now twelve keys in an octave. So the number twelve is associated with music, but the number twelve is just what we arrived at in with the with the ellipses because there were twelve the major and minor axis of two numbers per, per planet and six planets 12 numbers to explain and 12 is a musical number so Kepler indeed drew this conclusion he said well that explains it. so the universe must be designed on the musical basis there must be uh, musical harmonies must be the reason for why the planets are arranged in these particular fashions why the, the, the sizes of the ellipses are such and such and so on so that is uh, indeed he wrote a major work on this as you can see from this piece here and you can see you know the entire work is full of these uh, kinds of musical annotations and studies of uh, chords and uh, you know musical harmonies of all kinds are used to explain why the, so the solar system is arranged in, in, in the fashion that it is so well there we see that the numerology was still alive and well at, at this time so this has been my short history of numerology and of a point of view that has been entirely discarded in modern thinking, obviously, but which was uh, indeed very fundamental in, in classical thought and even still in, uh, well into the scientific revolution, as we've seen in the case of Kepler. So.